Welcome to the Market Huddle with Patrick the Content Machine Serezna and Kevin the Macro Tourist Muir. So grab a drink, get comfortable, and get ready for a deep dive into the markets. Take it away, guys. It's December 14th, 2018, episode number six. I'm Patrick Ceresna. And I'm Kevin Muir. Thanks for taking time to join us again. The Market Huddle is a weekly show where Patrick and myself get together over a couple of beers to talk about the week's action in the market, making sure to keep each other's feet to the fire and have a little fun in the process. This show is broadcast as both a podcast and on YouTube. So if you're enjoying this as a podcast and feel like you're missing out on some of the charts and videos that we're referencing, you can register at markethuddle.com website for the weekly email that includes the chart pack and video links, or just flip over to YouTube. In this week's episode, we're going to touch on the most important things that happened this week. We're particularly going to focus on Europe and on gold prices. In our This Week in Trading History, we're going to remember back to Madoff. And for this week's WTF Clip of the Week, we look at the biggest bear out on the street. In the Tales from the Trading Desk, don't forget your sample. And in the end, we're going to touch on the five most important things all of you need to watch next week. So let's jump into it. Kevin? Who's the show brought to us by this week? Well, this week we are actually drinking Lunch Money Beer by Collective Arts Brewery. It's a straight up easy drinking ale brewed exclusively with a German Magnum and Centennial hops to fuel your creativity. Let's hop in there. It's nice. You know what? I actually really needed this week. It's been a, it's been a choppy, Tough week in the markets, and uh, this is. Well, that's uh, just because you're not bearish enough, Kev. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Before we do anything more, let me just do my. Uh, yeah, I'm going to keep drinking my beer, and you just go and do that uh, silly disclaimer you do every week. That's right. Clients and employees of East West Investment Management may hold positions and securities mentioned in this podcast. Nothing in this podcast should be viewed as investment advice. Listeners should consult an investment professional before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned in the show. For more information, please visit eastwestfunds.com. Well, Patrick, it's been quite a week in the markets. What do you think was the most important thing? Kev, I just wanted to go away from the stock market for a second and just really touch on another topic near and dear to my heart, and that's gold. And really, one thing that I've been asking with uh, my big picture trading members is, uh, was the gold breakout real or was it a fake out? And so, so So what do you think? What's the prognosis? Well, want it to be a real breakout, but there's a couple of things that are the headwinds and I want to talk about it. I think that's important for us to do. So I've kind of made some bullet points here. So the first thing I want to say is like gold, first of all, decoupled from the US dollar for a couple of weeks. Well, the correlation for those listeners that aren't familiar with this, uh, gold really does behave like a cross currency to the US dollar. And so when the US dollar is strong, Gold tends to be weak and vice versa. And um, what we see, I shall show you in this one chart right over here, what we have is this, uh, the chart, uh, the candles are the gold price. And what we have in red uh, was, is the euro. In orange, we have the Chinese renminbi. And in yellow, we have that awful Canadian dollar, which I don't know who's long. <laughs> you, who, who's, who's bullish at the CAD? Yeah, so you just had to bring that up again, didn't you? Yeah, absolutely. We'll, we'll, it, we'll it's, the it. worst, it's the worst performing asset on this chart, is it not? Uh, well, maybe, but yeah. uh, I, I, <laughs> we'll see. You know what? That's going to be something that we're going to be talking about okay. in the coming quarters, and we'll see who's right you know, oh, oh so, so it, it, we, because we fixed no duration on this, you're just going to claim victory once the chart flips on you, right? Well, whatever. That's correct. So, so for two weeks, gold broke out. It's actually positive on this, uh, you know, year and a half, almost uh, sample of time that we have on this chart. And the question, of course, is can gold decouple from its correlation to the other currencies and cross correlation to the dollar and just keep plugging along. And I, I, to me, that's a big question to ask because uh, really uh, if, if the dollar breakout that we have witnessed in the last couple of weeks or at least even the last half a year continues, that could act like a wet blanket 
holding gold down. I'm so super bullish gold because at some point there's going to be a flip in monetary policy. And when there is, gold's going to be really good. But I just, I don't know whether this is the real deal. So now are you thinking that it is then a fake out and that we're going to drop back into the range? It just doesn't feel like, I, I feel like there's room for gold to still pause and that the real move is a middle of 2019 story. And, you know, and so is that going to correspond with the Fed giving up and actually? Yeah, I, that, that, would, that would make the most sense on a macro scale, wouldn't it, Kev? Well, you're right. And, and one of the things that gold is actually correlated to is real yields, meaning the yield on treasuries after inflation. Right. And when we had that October 3rd uh, thing from Powell where he got up to the, and, and he did that speech where he said that we're a long ways from neutral, we had real yields exploding higher. And it really caused these, these gold to, to struggle. It's difficult for gold, which at the end of the day is nobody's asset and is no, sorry, it's nobody's liability. And that, and that is in essence what attracts people to it. But if you have central banks that are, and, and the Fed especially, raising rates and, and creating a currency, you know, that actually has a real yield, then gold becomes less attractive. Because the, the, when we went into quantitative easing, that was what, what the real attraction to gold was, was it was nobody's liability. All these currency, all these different central banks were basically trying to debase their currency and, and de between quantitative easing and negative rates were trying to print their way into oblivion. But now we have a Federal Reserve that's actually looking like they're prudent and they're conducting a kind of responsible monetary policy, and at least from the uh, a U.S. dollar holders perspective, and that's really weighing on gold. Well, I want to touch on a couple more points. So uh, now, uh, what's interesting is silver has not confirmed the gold breakout, and uh, now it's the little the poor man's gold. It's the it's a little cousin, whatever you want to nickname it. But silver hasn't played. So I want to just show a couple of charts here first of all. So here's gold, and gold made that higher high from its October high right over here, right? And so it got, it got to a higher high. But when you look at the chart of silver, silver never made that higher high yet, at least not yet. But, uh, but to me, it, I think that if gold's real, that silver's got to break out too. I don't think that silver gets left behind in the thing. But also what I want to point out is that when we take a look at the prices of platinum, uh, the other precious metals, uh, platinum just looks awful. And but then of course palladium uh, has been running hot, right? I mean, it's yeah, at least playing. It's, it's running like it stole something. But that's uh, that's kind of a Tesla play. It, it ends up being that palladium is a great, a, a big input into uh, electric cars. So that's right. why the demand's going through the roof. Right. So it's uh, and that's bullish. But what's interesting to me, and what I'm waiting for confirmation as well. It's the gold miners themselves because it's truly like what I always say in a real bull market, it's sort of like the tide rising and all boats rise with the tide, right? If we were in a true gold breakout, we should have seen gold miners getting the bid, right? They, they should all have been uh, performing uh, really solid. And now there's been a few hot gold miner names. I particularly highlighted here, Franco Nevada, Barrick, uh, the Ashante, uh, 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 the Anglo Gold and uh, Kirkland Lake, like they they've been hot, right? They've all been ripping, but the juniors and many of the uh, other gold miners uh, just look awful, right? Like if you kind of look here, I'm going to use the GDX as an example, which you can see is, is plugging along toward its highs uh, uh, to to the upside. But look at the GDXJ, which is the juniors. They look awful. Yeah, it's a terrible looking chart. Right. And, and, you know, you take a gold corp, gold corp is uh, almost back down to its 52 week lows. So while we can identify those, like I'm going to use AU, the um, Anglo Gold Ashante, like what a great chart. Like they're just beautifully taken out from seven bucks to 12 bucks in, in four or five months, almost doubled. Like there's these gold miners that have been doing well, but as a whole, I'd like to conclude the majority of gold miners are acting like they don't give a shit about the recent pop in gold. That's right. And going back to silver for a second, usually you see in a real good precious metals bull market, you see silver leading the way, not lagging. 
yeah, yeah. You know what? I'm going to stress test that. I want to find out. It, it was, I, I, because I'm, I would suspect that Silver would have a lag and then play catch up and overshoot afterwards. But maybe I'm wrong. Uh, let's say, let's take a look at that afterwards. Is gold a, a breakout or a fake out right now? I'm still going to give the, uh, my, my line in the sand in gold is the 1225 to 1230. It's a, for the, when I measure squiggles, as you like to call them, uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's a, a key retracement zone. The way I'd look at it is if gold fell below 1225, 1230, then that would indicate that it was truly like a prairie dog, it just kind of pop and drop. And it's a noble animal. Were you going to mention? Yeah, <laughs> my favorite animal. Well, for me, I'm looking at gold priced in uh, Ramimbi. All right, let's put up that chart here. Because I think that's the real important chart. And I highlighted that uh, earlier in the summer, that the $8,100 was the level that everyone should be watching. I thought that the the People's Bank of China was defending that level, and I thought it was a great place to get long. It dipped below that, but it, that was kind of the reverse prairie, prairie dog in that it was very quickly bought, and it's going off to new highs, and I could see a situation where that's the thing that will lead gold on the upside from here on in. So do you think this is a breakout? So I think it's a very constructive looking chart. I think that those are. But is it, are do you want to see kind of break those levels around eighty six, eighty seven hundred here, where those, all these little consolidation highs have been? Well, you you love buying new highs. I, I just like to buy a, something that's progressively making higher lows, and to me, that's what that looks like. And I'm I'm long that thing. I think that's a great looking chart. Let's move on. What did you think is the most important event of the week? Well, there was a lot of action in the stock market, no doubt about it. It was trading just like garbage, and it was every single rally was sold. Um, but the, the, the stock market or, or that was the worst was Europe, and it was just terrible again. And it, it just looks terrible. It's a terrible-looking chart. It's uh, got a terrible feel to it, and there's all sorts of bad news coming out of Europe all the time. Uh, like I just saw there was something that Draghi was saying on Friday. We're taping this Friday after the market closed. Draghi briefed uh, EU leaders about the economic situation, mentioning that there is continuing confidence uh, and he's in approaching it with increasing caution, according to people familiar with the discussion. Uh, when you have the central bank of the uh, area of coming out and say, right? yeah, coming out and saying something like that, it is not... Uh, very inspiring. And when you combine it with the problems with Brexit and the, and the, the fact yeah. that there's, there was some chatter on the, on the kind of on the amongst traders that there was some sort of mid December derivatives uh, problem in terms of uh, moving it from London into Europe in terms of the clearing. And there was a lot of worry that those deadlines weren't going to be met. Because don't forget, a lot of those uh, OTC options and stuff so, used to be in London, but they're going to have to move. And right. we so, remember back in 2007, all the problems that occurred when those contracts weren't easily transferable and stuff. So there's just a huge amount of uncertainty out there. And you combine that with Italy. It's just, it's just a shit show. It is a shit show. And But it, to me, this makes no sense. Uh, l listen. When I think macro, uh, I think of a scenario where, listen, when the, uh, when the economy is doing poorly, a central bank is there to provide liquidity, to stabilize things, to re restart up the economy. As soon as the economy is up and running again, you take away the punch hole, tighten conditions, let the economy run. As soon as things get a little too hot, you kind of tighten more aggressively, cool it off, then the cycle kind of rolls over. Here we have a situation where for the last two years, Mario Draghi has been running the printing press. He's been pumping money, buying every uh, bond that has just not been nailed to the ground. Everything and with a Q-sip. If it's got a, a Q-sip, he, he buys it. it. He buys it. And you have a situation where the, he's saying, I'm now going to take the punch bowl away. And because uh, he's, he's about to retire and he desperately wants to try to, to. So this is pull. ego. You think this well, is all ego for sure. And uh, I think he's also trying to force a fiscal response because at the end of the day, 
the monetary can no longer do the heavy lifting. Whoa, 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 whoa. So how is it that he wants a fiscal response and, uh, and the rest of Europe or Brussels is not going to allow uh, Italy to run a, a higher uh, budget deficit? Well, it's, it's no different than in 2011 when Bernanke was begging Congress for a fiscal response and they, there was none coming. The uh, Tea Party made Obama cut the deficit. And uh, it was a situation where it ended up making Bernanke have to do more monetary stimulus because it was a contractionary fiscal policy that he was forced to, to uh, run. I, I think this is – I'm going to reiterate my major theme. My major theme is, is that I think that there's going to be big trouble – in the world and it's not starting in the United States. Now, after our Macro Voices interview yesterday, there's a lot of alarm bells about um, the uh, credit markets in the United States, but I still contend and I think that the major problems to start abroad and they like a contagion are going to spill in to the United States to slow things down. And boy, does Europe look like it's uh, high on the list of where this uh, shit can start hitting the fan. You know, I wrote uh, a macro tourist piece this week that was somewhat dollar, U.S. dollar bearish. And the flack that I got, oh, <laughs> you can't believe it. Well, uh, you, should, you deserve it. Yeah, you so, deserve it. so yeah, you, uh, you know, you try to defend it by uh, what, what was the analogy or what did you describe yourself when you, get, when you get the hate? Oh, I said, it's like uh, Star Wars with the Emperor. I said, I just, yes, let the, let the negative forces flow through you. That's how I feel. <laughs> um, well, you know what? Though, the more people that disagree, my best trades have been the ones where, the, where people have told me I'm the biggest idiot. And okay. I, I look back to Brent Johnson, and I wrote this piece, and Brent Johnson from Santiago Capital, you know, with his milkshake theory, I have to give him all the credit in the world because – Last year, at this time, Macro Voices did a roundtable on the U.S. dollar, and they couldn't find U.S. dollar bulls. So they ended up being just everyone described why they were bearish. And okay. now, look at it. It's, we're now a year later, and the U.S. dollar has just ripped higher, and it's almost the exact opposite scenario. All right. Well, here's my prediction. My prediction is that you're right, but just like uh, what you've demonstrated to me in the last six months, you're early to everything. You're like you're you're going to be eventually right. I I feel that there's a legitimate chance that the U.S. dollar is going to start the year incredibly strong, but is going to be in full sell mode by the end of the year, uh, in 2019. And uh, I think that. You're just early to the game. I, I feel that there's a good chance that we might spend the first quarter of next year with the dollar index ripping to 100, 105, and then it's just going to get slammed when monetary policy shifts. Uh, that's my view. I think it's one of the most crowded trades out there, and I, I asked you to go to the next slide, that I found this great uh, chart that shows ETF flows by country year to date. And if you go look... The U.S. has gotten two, I don't know if this is, in millions of dollars, U.S. dollars. So what's that? $229 billion has flowed, uh, flowed into the U.S. year to date. And then look at the bottom. Look the at Eurozone. that bottom one, the Eurozone selling of $8 billion. Yeah, but, but don't, don't you think that there has to be a couple things sorted out in Europe before they deserve to get the flows back? You oh, I, just, I, you I think it's just an, enough to be a contrarian by based on a number. Don't you think there has to be a real macro catalyst for that uh, shift? To me, though, it just feels like it's blood in the streets. It's just there's just no reason to own it, and everyone hates it, and everyone's telling me all the reasons why it has to go down further, and it's not. And I think it's a it's it's a great contrarian play, and uh, I love the, I love the trade. Right. So I again I I'm gonna say the same thing. I I think you're gonna be right. You're just early. So I think that if you're gonna buy Europe right now, you probably are gonna be down another ten plus percent in the near future. But then uh, a, a year or two from now, you're gonna be taking your victory laps. I just think you're early. Well, I think that if I I wouldn't buy Europe just outright, I would buy it against the U.S. And really? I think that's the okay, key. Okay, so yeah, so so yeah, because okay, the U.S. has not dropped the way Europe has, right? So okay, okay I got you, I got you. That's a, that's actually an interesting pair. So what would you do? Would you go like uh, uh, 
straight on S and P against like a German DAX or Eurostock fifty, just straight. Yeah, on. or the SX five E or whatever it is. Yeah. Would you do any currency hard. hedging in that, or would you just take it straight on? Uh, well, I like also being long euro as oh. well. So. Oh my. Yeah. God. No. Oh my God. All right. All right. So, so I know you hate that trade, and you're just you just no, can't I, stand the being anyone. Look, thinking about selling us dollars but i you, I, you just you have to explain to me how there where are the green shoots in europe it looks like that things are just about to get a lot worse i i completely agree it looks terrible it no, looks but it, awful but it, but it, but it, and, it and that's why you have to instead of selling is, it with everybody else you got to think about going the other way the best trades are the ones that you buy and you feel sick from when you buy them Those you know what i i'm sorry i don't think that there things have gotten sick enough a euro 105 with a german dax down 35 40 percent maybe that's going to be the puke point where i'll flip over and join your camp you're early dude you're early okay well we'll see sounds good all right. Okay. And this week in trading history, we remember back to Madoff. And so, Patrick, what, what year was it that Madoff uh, was arrested? December 11th of 2008, in yeah. the midst of uh, all of the crazy chaos that was happening uh, during the, um, uh, the market crash, suddenly Bernie Madoff gets exposed Oh, and what a story, right? So he, yeah. he ran a company, uh, Bernard Madoff Investment Securities, LLP. And uh, essentially, he, he was outright running a Ponzi scheme. He literally, it wasn't that he was lying about his performance uh, or misleading that. He just wasn't even investing the money at all. <laughs> he, he basically, this was... A complete money in, money out. As as p new people were investing their money, he was he was literally just sending it out the door to those that were withdrawing the funds. This do you is, know what? Do you know what my favorite part about Bernie was? That he what he learned how to do was make it so he was unattainable, and people wanted it all the more. He turned people down, and it made people want to invest even more. So okay. yeah, he's a crook and he's, he should go to jail and everything. But it kind of makes me laugh about the, the, the nature of humans that the, the, the more that you say no, it was like, oh, no, no, they no. Wanted. Yeah. And it was just, it was an incredible salesmanship skill that he did that way. Right. It's crazy. So what was interesting about the story though? was the failure of regulators to identify this. Now, he grew this to a multi-billion, with a B, dollar fraud. This wasn't just like, hey, a couple million dollars from a couple local investors. This is a multi-billion dollar fraud that he ran. One of the biggest in history. Was it the biggest in history? Oh, I, I think I, so, in terms of uh, frauds, for sure. Okay, so, but what was interesting, okay, there was this guy, Back, it started back in 1999. This guy named Harry Markopoulos uh, informed the Securities Exchange Commission that he believed uh, that it was uh, legally and mathematically impossible for Madoff to achieve the gains that he delivered. According yeah, I think he actually even wrote about it in Grant's Interest Rate Observer, if I remember correct. Exactly. So there was lots of, there was lots of signs, and a lot of people kind of suspected or knew that, there, that this couldn't be. So but what was interesting was that he said it only took him four minutes of, of basic math to add it up and one additional minute to suspect that everything was fraudulent. It took him five minutes of work and yet he presented it to uh, the, uh, the securities exchange people at the Boston office back in 2000, 2001 and later went to see this Megan Chang girl at the uh, SEC in the New York office in 2005 and again in 2007 to present further evidence. And it, in work that he took only five minutes to figure out, the Securities Commission uh, basically ignored this stuff for like seven, eight years. But he, well, I think, though, I, what people need to realize is how connected he was and what a big figure on Wall Street Bernie Madoff was. Because 
I remember way back when, when I worked at uh, one of the big Canadian banks, my boss said to me, you know, you should go down and you should learn how these NASDAQ traders are making all sorts of money. And he sent me down there for, for the day. And it's strange enough, he sent me to two firms. One was Knight Capital and the other was Bernie Madoff. And what? these, yeah, these firms were- So you, went, to, you went there? Yeah, and it was because that was the securities trading arm that would, don't forget back then, before they went electronic, before there was all the decimalization, before all the rules came into being, there was this crazy market in the NASDAQ where like Intel would be, would be 50 cents wide and you could only get a fill if you paid the offer or hit the bid. And these guys made fortunes just crossed it with people crossing the spreads all day. Wow. And, and he was at the forefront of this and he had a legitimate business that, that made markets in all these securities. But then he, he ventured into the money management side. And I, I think I heard that uh, I read that he, basically what happened was he got off side and then he just thought, Oh, I'll just do this one trade and then I'll be on side. And, and, and the trade just got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. Isn't that the way it always happens? The trade ticket yeah. in the desk. Yeah, the trick ticket in the desk. The, uh, but, you know, the one interesting part, A, he claimed, so here's some observations. He claimed he was using covered call writing as one of the approaches to making his returns. So, again, another sensitive thing for me. I'm an avid options trader. Covered call writing, one of the, the staple ways of generating income as an investor. And here he was claiming to be doing all these uh, income generating strategies. But what was interesting is when you're doing this with billion, supposedly billions of dollars, nobody knew which firms he was clearing with and no one could find the open interest on the markets to kind of cross match the big transactions he claims he was doing uh, was obviously completely fraudulent, right? Yeah. You know, it's one of these things in hindsight, it's so easy, so obvious, but at the time it was very difficult and, and wall street and, and trading in general is just littered with these things that, that, you know, when you hear the story, you're like, Oh God, how did you guys not know? But at the time there was lots of reasons that uh, people were scared and, and, and he managed to so, keep it going. So let me ask you something. Now, whether we're talking about, uh, Bernie Madoff, which was one of the big flags. One of the flags was that his returns were simply way too consistent. He was like returning 8% every year, year after year. No different than, uh, than China consistently producing the same GDP number uh, a quarter after quarter or year after year. What they say, we're going to have a 6.8 GDP and it's a 6.8 GDP. So when, what's the one thing we can say about somebody that reports consistent returns over and over again? Or what is it? So you're, so you're comparing the China to Bernie Madoff? All I'm saying is that what can you say about those returns? They're being cooked. Oh, for sure. China, any, I any, a, anyone, that is, anyone that is super consistent month after month of the same type of returns, you just know it's not real. That, you know, I have a friend that uh, moved to China and he always made me laugh because he said that they have a rule that they're not allowed to work if it gets hotter than 34 degrees Celsius. And then the amount of times that the high of the day is 33.9 is unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yes, of course, China is cooking their books and those aren't real numbers either. And I completely agree. But so uh, what a great story. Now, listen, there's a lot of people that got very badly hurt. But you know what? The whole when I say great story, it's like we're always looking for stories that, that to entertain on there. But, you know, a lot of people got so badly hurt by Madoff. And that's a, that's the sad part. Of, yeah, of I, I did read something the other day where the, the lawyer, there's been one lawyer that's been dogged in terms of tracking down all the money and he's almost made most investors whole now it's taken many many years and he sued investors that took their money out early and he's made them whole and that's kind of you know what is that 15 years later yeah so it's been a long time so there's no way it, in terms of you're nominally whole but the amount of actual money that you could have earned in the meantime is, is much less but the good news is that some people have managed to get the, some of their money back well kev let's move on 
So it's time for the WTF clip of the week. This is becoming slowly the, the favorite for our listeners. So getting to this part of the episode, what do you have in store for us, Kev? Well, we have a gem. You know, uh, there's, a, there's a guy out there that is always bearish. It doesn't seem no matter what, whether um, the market's ripping higher, or the market's going down, he's bearish. And he thinks the world's coming to an end. And we decided to make a clip of his recent comments that he made. And uh, well, I don't know, let's have, a, let's have a look. Nobody's in a perfect condition, least of all the United States. You know, I was listening to uh, the broadcast before I came in, and you yeah. talked about how the U.S. economy was sailing along. It wasn't sailing anywhere. It was blowing up like a gigantic bubble. That's what was happening. You could accept the fact that this city is headed for a disaster of biblical proportion. What do you mean, biblical? And now the air is coming out. We are headed for a much worse financial crisis than the one we experienced in 08, and we are headed for a much greater recession. This old testament mr yes. mayor real wrath of god type stuff exactly than the one we lived through following that crisis the one that we call the great recession and fire and brimstone coming down from the skies rivers and seas boy what's going to make it so much worse is it's going to be inflationary Cons years of darkness earthquakes volcanoes the dead rising from the grave was all a bubble i mean donald trump said so when he was a candidate he said it was a big fat ugly bubble and yeah. he was right Human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. Enough, I get the point. But what if you're wrong? If I'm wrong, nothing happens. We go to jail peacefully, quietly. We'll enjoy it. So, so Patrick, <laughs> do you think? Do you think if we sent Peter the video that he'd think it's funny? Um, well, that's a good question. You know, I. I I, I, I think I'm going to do it, actually. You know, yeah. I, I have his contact because uh, uh, the VRIC guys were trying to get us to get Peter to come out to the uh, Macro Voices live conference. We just didn't have enough room to consider it. But you know what? Uh, he's going to be out at the VRIC. So maybe this is a great way for me to make an introduction. I'll send, yeah, him, I, I'll send him the video and I'll say, to be discussed when I see Yeah, <laughs> he seems like he's a, a good-natured guy that I kind of think that's funny. So I, I'm, I'm hopeful that he's gonna think it's funny as funny as we think it is all right well I'm, I'm gonna send it to him now that you just said that uh, Peter I hope you're enjoying this when you're watching this now, so uh, Peter is one of the more uh, vocal bears out there no doubt about it uh, it doesn't matter whether well, the market it's not just down. the vocal bear I gotta I'm gonna pipe in here because it, here Pete you know what Peter completes me he's, <laughs> he's like a Batman Joker thing here like <laughs> If it wasn't for people like Peter existing, then I would be considered a perma bear, the, the awful grizzly on the street. But because of Peter, I get to be moderate. Yeah, that's to, right. I get You're to just... be like the middle, middle ground bear because to me, I, I want to be bullish, sometimes bearish. But see, because he is just so bearish, uh, I get to look uh, like a moderate. Yeah. What, what's the joke about betting on the end of the world? It's a dumb bet because if it pays off, you're, you're no longer around or something like that. It, and that's Peter. He just seems to be always thinking the world's going to end tomorrow. And uh, it's a difficult. I wonder uh, if he's got a bunker. Do you think, do you think, do you think he's, uh, he's a prepper? Do you think for sure he's a prepper? For sure. Guns, ammo, canned goods. Like he's got a bunker you for think sure. So? So you know, listen, I'm going to ask him when, yeah. when, I'm, when I'm at the VRIC, I'm yeah. going to ask him. But the true preppers won't tell you if they have a bunker and stuff because they're worried. He won't tell me where it is, but he's, I think he'll tell me that he's got one. Well, no, because they'll be worried that he'll be held hostage and he'll like, people will torture him for his bunker. <laughs> <laughs> When the world comes to an end and he's sitting on all his gold and stuff. At least he's not a Bitcoin guy. It could be worse. It could be worse. <laughs> all right, let's move on. Kev, it's time for Tales from the Trading Desk. This time you put something together. What's on your mind? Well, I, I wouldn't say I put something together. You know, this Tales from the Trading Desk, it's, a, it's an interesting concept. And sometimes we want to talk about different trades. And, uh, you know, other times we want to talk about specific opportunities that we see. And in this case, we're going to talk just about a great story. And it's... Uh, I've heard this story from a couple of different people on Bay Street, and I thought I'd share it with you. I don't know, um, Patrick, do you ever go to MedCan? Do you know what MedCan is? No. What so is Med MedCan's one of these fancy uh, Cleveland Clinic type places uh, where you go and you spend all this money and they, 
you go there for a day and they do all sorts of uh, medical tests on you and they check if you're going to, you know, lit, what the, whether you're going to have a heart attack tomorrow and stuff. You never heard of this? No, no, maybe really? I should go. MedCan is the biggest one and it's actually in Toronto and people fly from all over the world to come to this. And it's a, uh, it's a very thorough kind of uh, medical test that people do. And a lot of, you know, how much, it, how much does it cost to do? Something? I think it's a couple of grand or something. And it's, a, it's, it's uh, it, like it they make, take your blood and they do everything, right? They oh just, yeah. They, they do a million things. And uh, it's, it's, sometimes it's a perk that companies throw in. Well, it, it became kind of fashionable on uh, Bay Street to get MedCan. So the story was on, on this trading desk, one of the guys said that he was going. And he told everyone that it was going to be next month or whatever it was. And uh, they all cooked up this, this scheme. So in the meantime, someone else's uh, wife was a, a nurse or a doctor, or something that she had access to medical equipment. So she went and they, they got her to get a stool sample kit. And they told this guy on the trading desk, you know, you're going to MedCan for the first time. You know, I was there last week. They gave me an extra sample. I think you should, uh, I think you should make sure you bring it in. And he says, sample? What do you mean sample? And he says, well, you know, like a sample, like a stool sample. And he says, really? Like you want me to bring in a, like they want me to bring in a stool sample? And they said, yeah, for sure. You have to bring in your stool sample when you go to MedCan. So the guy was, uh, thought this was a little strange, but he picked up, you know, took the school sample home and uh, did his business and then showed up to MedCan to check in for his first ever appointment. You know, very fancy, very, you know, corporate, very, you know, sophisticated, all sorts of, you know, people in suits and stuff. And he's got himself this, this brown paper bag and he goes and he says to the <laughs> receptionist, he says, uh, here's my sample. And she says, pardon me, what do you mean? And he says, my stool sample. <laughs> and the look of horror on her face when she realized that this guy had brought in a stool sample. <laughs> and this guy had been had, he just instantly figured out that all the guys on the trading desk had had him. Oh my and God. So, so it's just, can you imagine showing up with your stool sample at this fancy corporate place, you know, trying to make a good impression? That's hilarious. Yeah. That's so. Anyway, that, well, what a great story. You know, that reminds me, actually, I'm going to save it for next week. I have a, I have a great story that's actually uh, from the trading desks when I was back at CIBC. I'll share that with, us, uh, with our listeners next week. Yeah. So yeah. just for, when someone tells you, don't forget your stool sample, you should look at them kind of a little strange and make sure you ask some questions before you bring it in. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Kev, it's time for the top five things to watch next week. But before we get to the new top five, we're just going to go do a throwback and see what we were watching this past week and how things played out. So our number, number five, you were looking at the uh, Aussie CAD cross because you were thinking that Aussie was going to head lower. How's that been working out for you, buddy? Well, so far, so good. I really, I really, I really like this trade. You know, oh, pull up no, the okay. chart. It's, it's a great trade. I think that China is, is going to have some... The awful, dude. The yeah, cat. but uh, you, do you know what looks worse is Australia. Oh, my God. And, and, yeah, and okay, I... Okay. I I really think China and Australia are going to are in for some real problems. I think that the oil, the bad news is all in the market. I think Canada is finally doing oh. some things well. I know you're super bearish. I get it. I get I, it. I get I, it. I, I'm not super bearish. I just can't. I just think you're you're so early to so many things. You're you're as early to the cat as you are on on Canada, <laughs> dude. You. You you are as early to to this uh, this CAD bull thing as I am to Goldman Sachs because I still I, I have to trying to figure out how to get out of my puts on Goldman Sachs. But well, why don't we? Yeah, why don't we go on to number four, which is Goldman Sachs? If you're going to rim me about odd CAD, then like a, let's let's talk about well, Goldman Sachs. You know what? I I sold before that whole Malaysia thing started happening and Goldman Sachs started falling apart at the seams. I I put. I sold some puts uh, on Goldman and it's just been my, it's been the worst thing in my portfolio. It's just been awful. Uh, the, the Goldman Sachs, but you know what, this is the whole thing. When we get, actually let's combine number four with number two, because 
we were talking about the S&P and will it make 52-week new lows. It hasn't yet broken to 52-week new lows, but, but it is almost there. And what's been, like when the S&P tried to rally earlier this week, the financials could not even react. Yeah. Well, I'm dialing uh, Goldman Sachs and it's worse than the S&P. It's a terrible looking chart. So you really picked a real dog there. Oh, geez. <laughs> it, dude it's got it's getting the eviction noticed it's uh it, it, this is not one look at some point every stock is a buy i'll be back to goldman one day but right now it's getting the eviction notice that's for sure anyway well, let's, some, go, let's some, go back to number three though uh, yeah that's some good discipline you're showing on on goldman sachs because it takes like that is something that everyone should think about there's, you know, at some point you're wrong and you have to admit you're wrong and drive on. So that's great. Uh, speaking of wrong, why don't we look at my number three, which is uh, Brexit, new Italian budget, ECB rates. Oh, wrong. You didn't, you weren't bullish Europe, were you? Yeah, but I've been <laughs> bullish on Europe for a while. So um, I've been wrong. It was interesting. Brexit just is just a disaster. Uh, yeah. Three, it's a Brexit's a disaster. The Italy thing, what Italy says and what Italy does is going to be two different things. Germany looks awful. They're trying to merge their banks to because, uh, because Deutsche Bank looks like death. You know, the one a year for great trades. And, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the good thing about merging their banks is the fact that uh, the, the government owns a bunch of commerce bank. Which yeah. means that if they merge it, the government will own Deutsche Bank, and it'll be in some extent backstopping the banks. I listen. Yeah. I I think that we need to in our, one of our future shows touch on this. Uh, that whole situation in Europe and these banks is worthy of us having a deeper dive into. Uh, I think it's so interesting how it's going to play out. I don't think that uh, it's going to be a total disaster, but I just still think investors in the shares. Uh, are still going to get a further punishment, no matter how bad it's been up till now. Anyway, let's move on to number one. What happened in China? China, it was terrible. China data just continues to just yeah. stink. And that's the, that's the real problem. You were making fun of them earlier about massaging their data. They're not even bothering massaging it anymore. They're just... Yeah, they're absolutely... It's just looking awful. China, in my mind, has bailed out the world twice. In 2008, and then later during the whole European crisis, they had two big liquidity surges where they pumped up the credit system. And I think Trump has now pissed them off. And they say, listen, we have to correct our excesses and we're not going to bail out the world. We're going to go through our little hiccup and we're going to uh, and we're going to make everyone feel the pain. What's I, it, am I off? I, no, I completely agree. And I think that the timing for China all centers around that 2020. Uh, it's a big anniversary of the Communist Party. And there, to me, I don't see any signs of them rushing into saving anything in 2019. Why? Because if, if they rushed in to save their economy and reinflate it, it's going to reinflate the world. They, they want the rest of the world to – look, if, they, if you want to invoke change, let's say – let's just go under a little theory. Obviously, you know, we had um, Louis Vincent Gav on Macro Voices yesterday, and uh, he was talking uh, – he's a big China guy, and he was kind of contemplating – global de-dollarization and this idea that well, that, well, how do you get any change? Change needs to be done in some form of a crisis. And so if China wants to really de-dollarize, they need uh, shit hitting the fan a little bit in order to justify the, the, the transition or forcing it. Like, I just don't see any reason why China is going to in a rush to turn things around. They're going to let it bleed a little bit. I agree, and that's why you should be careful because uh, between the Fed keeping money tight and China not being in any rush to save anything, there's just no real kind of hope over the short run, and that's why we're seeing risk assets sell off. Let's move on. Okay, Patrick, let's go on and let's talk about the top things to watch next week. What's number five? I want to talk Johnson & Johnson. The news came out that they may have known for decades – about asbestos in their baby powder? Was that the story headline? Uh, you know what? You're, uh, you're more up to speed on this. Than and you. the point is, is that the stock just had an awful drop. It, it, here I have just a chart. Uh, that's the candle chart over there. And the stock wipes out uh, something like $13, $14 in one day. It yeah. was opens 145 goes out at 133 Just ugly looking chart. Even it was... For 
a non-technician like me, I can tell you that's a bad looking candle. That's a bad looking candle. It wiped out, it wiped out basically four months of progress in the stock in one shot. Why I care about it is that it is the Amazon to uh, the discretionary ETF. It, uh, Johnson & Johnson makes up uh, well over 10%. I think like something like 11% of the weighting in the XLV, which is the Exchange Traded Fund for Healthcare. It is like the behemoth. And why is that relevant to me? Because healthcare was one of the safe haven places that have been performing well, where investors have been gaining returns in a period where the majority of sectors have been getting killed. It was somewhere and to hide. It was somewhere to hide. And now all you've got are rates and utilities. The healthcare has just got murdered. And, and so the, the thing is, if you go look at this chart back to February, when Johnson & Johnson got hit on this news the first go around, it led to a four month distribution cycle, a period where after news came out, things just kept getting worse and worse uh, on, on the downside. And to me, a break like this, I don't think that there's a recovery overnight. And does this drag the whole healthcare space down? That's what I'm watching this week. Well, why don't you dial the XLV while we're at it and give us your technical advice on that one? Cause uh, it looks like it's holding so far. Do you think that those, uh, those those lows hold? Uh, I don't. I don't think they hold. Uh, let me just pull it up uh, the chart up here. You, uh, by the way, in full disclosure, we've been long this XLV. So, but a lot of my members have been locking in the gains up at our target zones uh, with at ninety five and ninety six with protective puts. And I think that uh, everyone here is just going to be pulling the plug and exercising the puts to knock themselves out. The, t to me. The, the, this doesn't look good. This looks like a big reversal. Uh, I, listen, that's a good hallmark sign of a bear market. There become less and less places to hide and everything just starts going down. And I, I'm really asking the question here, uh, you know, is this just a bad sign that things are just going to keep getting worse? Getting worse. Sounds like you put on the full grizzly outfit there. <laughs> okay, so let's go on to number four. I believe that one's for you as well. Right, so number four, we were asking, is this dollar breakout for real? No. And, uh, <laughs> well, you have, you're entitled to your opinion, Kev. And in full disclosure, it hasn't broken out yet. Yeah. All right? But after, if you go back to February and March, for, for a better part of two, two and a half months, the dollar stayed in a consolidation. And when it finally broke out, it began a run it's from about the 90 level to about 96. It was about a six point run on the Dixie uh, that, that advanced to the upside. We've been at this stage in about a two month consolidation in the dollar pinned in this kind of 96 to 98 range, let's say 97 and a half range. With this Euro breakdown, could this spark the dollar index rally? And if it does, it's clearing 100 on the upside. Will it happen? That's what I'm watching this week. Well, and I think that if we do get something where, and I spoke about this in my post, that it might be that we get one final hurrah, you know, with people trying to show that going into year end that they were stuffed full of U.S. assets. So I could see us breaking out and doing the classic prairie dog formation. Oh, and no. popping, no. popping to 90, 98, 98 and a half, and then close. I'll take the other side of that bet. Okay. Uh, so there you go, folks. If she, if it pops out to 98 or 98 to 98 and a half in the next couple of weeks, I'm a seller. Patrick is buying the new highs. I'm selling the new highs. All right. They, everyone's heard it. My, here's my call. Here's my call. It hasn't broken out. So, but if we break out, we're clearing 100, maybe even going to 105. But in the first quarter of next year, we start seeing the major highs of the dollar. And there's going to be a big flip-flop. And there's going to be a big bear opportunity on the dollar on the other side. But we're, my opinion is that we're still going to get – it's not going to be a prairie dog. There's another full leg to this trend coming to the upside that's going to get everyone bought in. And you're going to be right. Just again, you're way too early. Okay, well, let's move on to number three. Number three. So, Kev, what's on your mind here? It's a uranium stock, Cameco. So, it's just uh, 
it's a great looking chart and there's uh you look at this if you think about it there's nothing going up in this market except uranium stocks and uh I just think it's and, something and like recent utilities, but yes, yeah, I, you're right. Um, one of the things that you do need to be aware of is that Silver Wheaton uh, recently did a huge uh, or, or kind of it's a wheat and precious metals now. Well, wheat and precious metal. I was showing you my age there, talking about yeah. Silver Wheaton, but they they had a problem. They were fighting yeah. with the government about uh, CRA. Yeah, that's right, the Canadian Revenue Agency about taxes owed and. Uh, the same kind of very similar situation with Kamiko is that uh, they uh, are also in the process of fighting and they had settled they to won. They won, but they're still kind of going back and forth in terms of the negotiations. And Silver Wheaton came out and they did a terrific, they got a great deal. And, and some smart, shrewd people are starting to look at it and going, wonder if CCJ or CCO, uh, what is the symbol in Canada these days? Uh, it's, it's CCO in Canada yes. or CCJ in the US. That's right. It, so it, this chart it, that everyone's looking at here is the Canadian dollar price, but, uh, but it is the, it's the same chart pattern in, yeah. uh, on the US side. And just uranium in general, I think it's a great place to hide and it's a great long-term story. You know, but I, it's interesting because I would have thought that Cameco being a, a kind of this like basic material storyline, it is whether energy or basic material, whatever you want to label it. I would think that it would have got indexed, bought and sold with the rest. I'm like, when you go to the broader basic materials, even chemicals and everything, everything's just being murdered. I well, would have, but I think though, doesn't that indicate there's probably some buying? And yeah, so of course the market, it does. Of yeah, course so. it does. Because if you think about it, if it, if it was just being driven by index selling chemical would have been, uh, down two three dollars lower than where it was, and so the fact that it's holding up in spite of the broad distribution in the basic material space is, uh, yes, it looks bullish. And it and it's a great place to hide. It's it's one of the few kind of true value names out there. That, well, but the uh, problem is we both agree that so all yeah. So it's it's definitely market. not going to work. So you guys should sell it right away. <laughs> okay, let's move on to number two. All right, so for number two, I wanted to to talk about the Russell. Uh, and and I asked the question, is it the tell? Uh, Russell is the small cap stock. Right. So Russell is the middle America. See, so in the U.S., the, the S&P 500 is these massive international conglomerates that uh, that have all of this financial engineering and and, and they're global. They're matter. truly global countries. I mean, companies. They don't. Yeah. They, it's not just America. So when we go to the Russell 2000, we're not even talking mid caps anymore. We're talking small caps. And then now, while we say small caps, they aren't necessarily small. Like, I mean, they're still billion plus uh, operations, but they, they, they are more American in terms of uh, what they're more sensitive to the American economy. Right. That's why we call them like middle America. Right. Right. And so to me, what's interesting is just how poor the Russell has been. And what you can see here, yes, this is the Russell chart. I know you prepared some charts on the Russell as well, but I just want to put it up here. And when the S&P 500 managed to rally in the last week, this was all the Russell could do. Nothing. Could For not those even, like it, listening to it, it barely bounced. It, 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 just, it just stopped going nothing. down. Was like, I mean, the, the, when you look at the October, November lows, you know, more or less around 1470, you, uh, we could not even muster up to, uh, uh, to get above the level where it broke. And, the, and I asked the question, is the Russell – uh, a sign that the bearish selling is not done in the S&P. Well, I think the Russell looks a lot like the rest of the world stock markets. Whether I couldn't agree more. Canada, like, whether it be you know Europe, uh, emerging markets, it, it's really we're left with uh, what what's hanging in there. The S&P 500 and and a little bit of the Nasdaq and even the Nasdaq starting to get sold. Right. Right? It's it's starting to get sold. So what was this chart that you wanted to share with us? Well, over? this is this is the Russell 2000 versus S&P 500 ratio since 1982. So you'll see coming out of 2000, small caps really outperformed. In, and for the next uh, 10 years, the ratio rose. But in, then we go to the next chart where we see it in the last five years. It's, it's been 
headed downward. And then when we go to the next chart and we look at the over the last year, it's it, it hit a high in June. And ever since then, it's just been straight down. And it shows you that anybody that was trying to hide in small caps or thought that the that there was going to be real growth in the small cap and that was what you should own has just been crushed. And it's, it's just, those are, it's, it's brutal. And, you know, just to make the, to emphasize the point that you just illust- uh, said, I overlaid here the Russell uh, in orange with the candle chart as the uh, Canadian TSX 60. And what I, the point is, is that I, the Russell looks more like an international index, like the Canadian TSX, than it does look like uh, the, uh, the S&P 500. It's, and, and is it a tell? I think it is. So I, do you think it's a tell for the economy not being in, in America as strong as the bulls would, would? I think it's more about global liquidity, right? Uh, I think it's much more about the fact that I think that uh, the stock markets are in a very, very difficult place you know, around the world because liquidity is being drained out of the system. And while the uh, S&P 500 behemoths can financially engineer with buybacks and other things and maintain prices that are artificially higher temporarily than they should be, but the, the small caps can't do it. And I think the small caps are telling you that where, where U.S. stocks really probably should all be trading. So, and, and that's why we're seeing that the, even the S&P now is coming to this and a lot of yeah. days we're closing on this the lows of the day. You know, the, we're, we're taking the triple P, uh, uh, the, uh, sort of the triple P uh, grizzly bear is out in full force here. This does not look good. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's bad market action. And uh, what, what would it take for you to get bullish? What would it take apart from the stock market going higher? I like need to see truth? leadership. I need to see leadership, Kev. Uh, what, 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 what you have to tell me, what is the sector that, look, that is going to grab the, 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 the role of the general, the, grab the flag and rally the troops and drive it because you need market breath, but the market breath begins with money flow coming into one sector. The financials look like shit. Uh, the Russell looks like shit. You, you have uh, now the healthcare is turned over. The, what sector is imminently about to, uh, to grab that, that banner flag and, and rally the troops? Can you identify it? Uh, you know what? All I can think to myself is that I'm going to have to make a video of you like Peter Schiff pretty soon. Because that sounds like a pretty bearish guy. Anyways, Listen, let's, I am let's, willing to be bullish if you can prove to me where it's coming from. And, I, and when I see it, I will turn bullish. I will you, turn bullish. You, you know that. You know what? I do know that and you will be that. Uh, and Peter it's will stay Right bearish. now, there's no That's sign of it. That's so right. What, yeah. what is number one on your mind here, Kevin? Well, next week is the FOMC meeting. And do we finally get the, the one and done meeting, which I think is what we're going to get. Will Powell come out and say, we're going to raise rates this one last time, and then we're officially on pause. And I think that we're going to see Tudor Jones thinks so. That was yeah. a great interview. And, you know, and I think, I think he's, we're going to have to make that into our WTF video next week somehow. I don't know, just because it was such a great interview. But uh, I, I love the guy, by the way. Like, yeah, oh, he's just it, he's my hero. Like the guy's so smart. And uh, and we, what was interesting about him was that he, his call for next year was interesting as well. Did you did you catch yeah, that? Ten down, ten up, right? Yeah, in terms of the stock market, he yeah. thought that we were going to go up and down. I. I uh, I'm going to take the other side of that. I, I look ten, oh. ten. Listen, I'll tell you what. Ten up is just a, a reaction of the market right now. Like, think of it this way: if we drop, we're down ten percent. If we drop another ten percent on the downside, we're down twenty. A fifty percent retracement that is ten up. All you're doing is basic Fibonacci and uh, uh, squiggles. Okay. So like, let's go. Let's go back to this. You said you're going to take the other side of, of Paul Tudor. I, I, th- I think the ball. So first of all, I, I think he's going to be phoning you up and saying, "What the hell, dude? Like, what? What are you talking about here?" So, I think. I think it's just going to be more volatile than that. I. I. Th- I, th- I would even argue we, we could be 20 down 20 up i th- i think that the volatility is going to be monstrous next year and i think he's just being too conservative with 10 up 10 down well it'll be interesting to see when we go 10 down and i think that for you to get your 10 or 20 down it's we're going to need to see powell and the rest of the crew stay hawkish and if that happens then i could see you being correct but i think that oh come well, on i think, Listen, I think let's stop telling, right there stop okay. right there kev yeah you know what I think that the, by the time the Fed does anything, anything that could actually make an impact on the market, the market will have already uh, done all the damage. The, the, at this stage, uh, listen, 
at some point they have to turn dovish. And just like you, we talked about last week's show when you made that Rosenberg quote that the, his fear is that they're not going to become uh, loose fast enough. That is exactly going to be the problem. You know, it, it, them pausing, them thinking things through. The stock market can wipe out another 10% next week, dude. The, there, there is no way that the Fed is going to be reactive enough to, to stop the volatility in the market. Now, at some point, there will be money made on the upside, but there is no way it's just 10 down, 10 up. There's going to be more volatility than that. That's okay. my call. There you go, folks. Uh, Patrick's taking the other side of Paul Tudor Jones' <laughs> trade. <laughs> anyway, any last comments on the FOMC meeting next week? I, I think it's an important one to watch. It should be really interesting. And most Is it one and done? Is it one and done? Uh, oh, for sure. It's one and done. But without a doubt in my mind, it's one and done. More importantly is how does the market react to the one and done? And He's I'm not hope- going to now. Okay, but let's be clear to all our listeners. They're not going to announce they're done next week. Next no. week, they're going to announce the rate hike, and then they're going to say they're data dependent. That's the way I would interpret it. Right? Yeah, but the, but it, the real question will be whether they lean more dovishly or hawkishly at that point. And, and they will have a choice. And, and it's very subtle. You're right. It's not just like well, they're not going to come and say one and done. But they will, they will communicate through subtle kind of messaging whether they are going to be uh, eager to quickly raise rates again or whether they're going to let it, let it run a little bit more like the Neil Kashkaris of the world would like. And that's right. the real question. Does the Neil Kashkaris uh, kind of camp win out and Powell shift to, the, to that camp? Let's watch. I think that's a huge thing to watch. I th- it's, it, it, if this was the last rate hike, that actually is huge because think about it. It takes years for monetary policy to shift. And so if this is the turn point, this is a multi-year moment uh, in, in the whole monetary cycle. I think it's so important to watch. I have to agree with your call here, Kev. Okay, Patrick, sounds great. Now, don't forget, on top of the FOMC, it's quadruple witching Friday. And if there's Where'd one, you get this picture, dude? Yeah, That's awesome. It, yeah, no, it's the four <laughs> witches. If there's one thing I've learned, it's that you shouldn't, you shouldn't trade on that day. That looks like Merkel on the second one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're just full of uh, all sorts of uh, very nice Me Too movement kind of comments today, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll let Merkel know that you're saying that about her. All right. No um, the, uh, yeah. So just be careful because all sorts of weird stuff happens. It's like Halloween. You never know what's going to happen on quadruple. Yeah. So yeah. just to clarify to everyone, this is where all the derivatives are coming to maturity, uh, at the end of the week. And what happens is that as traders have to unwind and roll, it causes all sorts of volatility that is not necessarily driven through normal market flow. So there's chop, there's a lot of mess. You just got to let it pass. Yeah, and, and oftentimes you'll see uh, reactions that have make no sense compared to the actual fundamental news that you're getting. And you just have to chalk it up to quad, quad witching and don't worry about it. Right. So I want to move on, though. Uh, I want to go to the parting words of wisdom to wrap things up here. And so, Kev, I kind of dug this one up. And uh, Philip Fisher is another one of these kind of Jesse Livermores. Uh, going back, I think, to like 1928. He's, he's an old school. Do you, you, are you familiar with him? No, I'm not really, actually. You dug this one up without me. Yeah, so uh, he, he was an old school trader, had his own firm back then in the uh, 1920s and 30s. And uh, he, he's known for uh, coining this one phrase. I thought it was so great. The stock market is filled with individuals who know the price of everything, but the value of nothing. Wise man, that Philip Fisher. Wise, Wise man. man. Yeah. I, I think everyone needs to go and pick up his book. Well, thanks for spending time with us. Uh, please visit our site at markethuddle.com to sign up to receive our weekly email, which hopefully we will do this week. Uh, you know, I, I've kind of fallen down, but give us a break. We'll, we'll, we're going to get on that right away. Um, it'll include a link to the show and the charts that we discussed. Uh, rest assured, we will never clog your email and we will only send you our weekly updates uh, for upcoming shows. Also, please follow us on Twitter at themarkethuddle.com. Also, you could follow Kevin and I on Twitter. Uh, my uh, Twitter handle is at Patrick Ceresna. And Kev, what you're at? Uh, at Kevin Muir. Perfect. So thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks again to our sponsor, the uh, Lunch Muddy Beer. Actually, 
it, it was so from good. collective was, arts, right? That's right. And it was, it was gone kind of uh, within the first third for me. I don't know about you. I liked it so much. I actually still have about a quarter left. I, I, I was so busy uh, worrying about razzing you that I totally forgot to drink the rest <laughs> of the beer. I'm going to well, quickly chug it right now. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. And we'll see you next week. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.